as our keynote speaker, who brings with him a wealth of experience and a profound understanding of the complex dynamics between democracy and development. We are equally delighted to have the esteemed Sultan of Sokoto, His Eminence, Muhammad Saad Abu Bakr III, CFR, MNI, and the Most Reverend Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, the Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto, who will enlighten us on the crucial topics of religious tolerance and inclusiveness. The awards will serve as beacons of light, guiding us towards uniting a harmonious society where all Nigerians can coexist peacefully, regardless of their religious affiliations. Furthermore, we are honored to have Dr. Akim Umi Adeshina, COL, the President of the African Development Bank, who will share his invaluable insights on further strengthening of our economy during the Tunubu years. His expertise and guidance will undoubtedly foster or steer us toward enhanced sustainable economic growth and prosperity. We are also privileged to have Ms. Amina Mohammed, GCON, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, who through a recorded message will be sharing her deep understanding of the intersectional ability between security and development. She will shed light on the path to achieving a secured and prosperous Nigeria. And finally, we have the youthful and esteemed Dio Israel, the national youth leader of the All Progressive Congress, who will emphasize the critical importance of youth inclusiveness in governance. His perspective will remind us of the immense potential that lies within our vibrant youth population and the need to improve them or empower them as catalysts for positive change. In conclusion, let us approach this inauguration lecture with open hearts and open minds, ready to embrace the wisdom shared by our esteemed speakers. May their insight ignite our imaginations, challenge our perspectives, and spur us to take bold and decisive actions that deepen our democracy and accelerate our journey towards sustainable development. May this inauguration lecture be the catalyst that propels us towards the Nigeria we continually envision, a Nigeria that thrives on democracy, embraces inclusivity, and realizes the aspiration of its people. Thank you. Once again, welcome and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in 1999, Nigeria took a decisive step to return to democratic governance. 24 years down the line, the country is undergoing its seventh consecutive transition from one civilian administration to another. That, Your Excellencies, provides the platform for today's lecture, Deepening Democracy for Development and Integration. Let me take just a moment to tell you a bit about the keynote speaker. His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, CGH, is the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya. He served as president for two terms between 2013 and 2022. He had previously served as a member of parliament, leader of the opposition, minister for local government, deputy prime minister, and minister of finance. Former President Kenyatta's presidency was underpinned by a commitment to economic and social transformation, national unity, good governance, regional integration, and intra-Africa trade. Under President Kenyatta's leadership, Kenya consolidated its position 
as a leader in climate change, the blue economy, and digital technologies that emerged Nairobi as a regional hub for major international organizations and corporations. In addition, from 2021 to 2023, Kenya served a two-year term as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Following the promulgation of a new constitution in 2010, His Excellency Kenyatta presided over the rolling out of an ambitious program to restructure the Kenyan state involving large-scale political, fiscal, and administrative decentralization. During his last term, His Excellency Kenyatta was chair of the African Union Peace and Security Council and the Summit of East Africa Community Heads of State. In addition, he was the chair of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, a coalition of African Union heads of state and government to drive accountability and action for results against malaria. He also served as the president in office of the Organization of the African, Caribbean and Pacific States, comprising 79 African, Caribbean and Pacific States. In addition, he is still serving as a member of the high-level panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, a unique initiative of 14 serving world leaders to build momentum towards a sustainable ocean economy. While still in power, His Excellency Kenyatta served as a global leader for the Young People's Agenda under the UN-led Generation Unlimited Initiative, GenU, which seeks to ensure that by 2030, all young persons aged 10 to 24 are in school, training, or employment. In July 2022, before his retirement from the presidency, the former president was endorsed as Global Champion for Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program by world leaders. All the regional level and at the regional level, former President Kenyatta championed regional integration, intra-Africa trade, and a more vital role of the African continent on the global stage. In addition, he was at the forefront of promoting peace and security efforts in the region. Following his retirement from presidency in August 2022, His Excellency Kenyatta was appointed as the East Africa Community Facilitator of the Nairobi Process Inter-Congolese Consultations aimed at restoring peace security and stability in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The former president also serves as a special envoy for the Horn of Africa and Great Lakes region alongside three other mediators appointed to spearhead the Ethiopia Tigray AU led peace talks. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me at this point humbly invite His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, CGF, the keynote speaker at today's inauguration lecture, to now deliver his, his lecture. Your Excellency. Your Excellency Mamadou Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Your Excellency Vice President-Elect Senator Kashim Shetima, all elected leaders here present, your eminences, traditional leaders here present, leaders of our different faiths here present, Your Excellency members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by saying a good morning to all of you and at the very onset to take this opportunity to thank you, President Buhari, and your entire team for inviting me to Abuja 
for the second time in under a year to engage together with you in meaningful discourse with leaders of Nigeria. I must, at a personal level, however, confess my great affinity to a man who I consider to be one of my closest colleagues when I was in government, but also a wise and sober father figure in the name of President Buhari. Indeed, as a son who retired before the father, I look forward to welcoming you to the very exclusive club of former African presidents, a club that remains exclusive because it only admits members who have willingly retired from office. Indeed, it is a great honor and privilege for me to join you all this morning on a weekend when the country is preparing itself to witness its seventh consecutive civilian leadership transition. Your Excellencies, this is not a moment to be taken for granted, and to this end, I must take this opportunity to extend my most heartfelt and sincere congratulations to the people of Nigeria for choosing yet again to walk the more difficult path to look past the challenges of a difficult election and to embrace the learnings that come from a maturing democracy. In every high stakes contest there will always be those who emerge victors and also those who will end up being losers. What has set Nigeria apart from many nations on our continent today is that its leaders have chosen to disappoint the naysayers and the prophets of doom and have opted instead to express their political differences within the framework of a constitutional order. <clears throat> this is not an easy thing to do when there are many other ways and means to express dissatisfaction, methods that could easily trigger civil unrest, lead to loss of life, and cause irreparable harm to your nationhood. In the unlikely event that no one has mentioned it to you, let me say it today that Nigeria is a country blessed with a generation of great need leaders, both inside and outside of the government, be they in Aso Rock, in Lagos, or Anambra. I salute you all for steering the nation peacefully up to this milestone moment. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was invited here to speak on the topic of deepening democracy for development, a subject that remains close to my heart, and it is my hope that you shall permit me to speak freely and to say things as they are so that you can glean the most from my own experiences and observations as a former head of state. Experiences that not only celebrate success, but that equally acknowledges challenges. And I want to speak to you not as a Kenyan speaking to Nigerians, but as one African speaking to fellow Africans. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the last set of African nations to attain self-rule and independence from the shackles of colonialism and apartheid was 33 years ago in 1990 when Nelson Mandela and Sam Nyoma 
took the reins of their respective countries. One would have expected that three decades on from the departure of those who had oppressed, discriminated, and exploited our people for centuries, that our continent, Africa, would find herself to be not only more prosperous, but socially and economically stable. We would have harnessed our immense God-given mineral wealth, our agricultural potential, and our abundant human capital to propel the well-being of our citizens and to strengthen our voice in the global community of nations. It is sad to note that today, many thousands of our children are migrating to Europe on fishing boats, fleeing from chaos and poverty, and braving harrowing dangers in search of a so-called better life. Over the last five decades, more than half the countries in Africa have experienced some form of armed conflict. African states have either been at war with each other or at war with themselves. Today, as I stand before you, there are at least 15 active theaters of non-international armed conflict on our continent, with a few more tittering on the brink. We must go back and ask ourselves, why are we here? We must remember that when our borders were carved up in European boardrooms in the late 1880s, our societies were torn apart by boundaries that do not reflect how we would have chosen to organize ourselves. Traditional kingdoms were split or destroyed in their entirety. Those who shared common languages and other fraternal bonds found themselves on different sides of arbitrary borders. And in some cases, the colonialists imposed one community to superintend over others as part of their divide and rule strategy that would allow them to govern indirectly. In very few parts of Africa was any border drawn to accommodate religious and ethnic homogeny. The consequence we found ourselves inside countries that were somewhat a mixed bag. I believe, as some would say, that you deal and live with what you're dealt with and make the most of it. Why do I say so? I say so because these differences, in and of themselves, are not fatal. They only become toxic if we as a people let them. We must start to see strength in our diversity if we are really serious about assuming our rightful place in this world as Africans. And why do I mention this? because it is important to understand the genesis of most of these conflicts and what impact they have on our development trajectory as a continent. We must strive to identify the natural fissure lines existing within our societies that make it so easy for conflict to thrive and for democracy to be undermined. Against this backdrop, we can drill down to what I feel and believe are the three fundamental issues that are so easily weaponized 
to the detriment of our democratic growth. The first of these is negative ethnicity or tribalism, followed by religion, and lastly, economic greed. When you look deeply at the crux of most of our conflicts within our continent, we are either fighting for ethnic or sub-ethnic superiority of one community at the expense of others, or we are propagating divisive narratives that have their origins in religious differences or sectarianism. As we sit here today, we know for a fact that some of these elements I have mentioned remain a clear and present danger for the future of Nigeria. The incoming administration has a unique opportunity to use this inflection point brought about by a peaceful and orderly transition to take stock of what sort of future it wants for the people of this country and for the future of this nation. Will Nigeria continue fighting for its place on the world stage with one hand tied behind its back? Or will it use this moment in time to embrace a brave new way of doing things and thereby unleashing the full might of this green giant? As you ponder on that thought, allow me to take you back to a time in 2013 when I was first elected into office. At that time, I was facing the most serious challenge of my life, both as an individual and in my capacity as president. I was facing a trial at The Hague for alleged crimes against humanity, charges that were later proven to be unfounded. As I went on to settle into State House, I found myself introspecting more and more as to how I ended up in this unenviable position and what were the deeper issues and what these could be. I summarized at the time that it was an unfortunate side effect of the deeply contested 2007 elections that led to widespread inter-ethnic violence causing the loss of some 1,300 lives and the displacement of over 600,000 Kenyans from their homes. At the center of this violence was fighting between the tribes or ethnic communities ostensibly associated were the leading political actors of the day. My predecessor and the third president of Kenya, His Excellency the late Mwai Kibaki, the leader of the opposition at the time, the Honorable Raila Odinga, my successor and the fifth president of Kenya, William Ruto, and of course, yours truly, myself, as the party leader of the then Kenya African National Union and a supporter of the incumbent President Mwai Kibaki. What started off as an election dispute over results between political parties very quickly escalated into a full scale conflict between different ethnic communities whose perceived historical differences were easy powder kegs to ignite. How did we get to this low point? 
Whereas what happened in 2007 was unprecedented in its scale and ferocity, election-related violence was not a new phenomena in Kenya per se. We had seen some different manifestations of ethnic-based electoral violence from the early 1990s with the reintroduction of multi-party democracy. However, nothing was like what we were to witness in 2007 and 2008. With a country of 43 distinct ethnic communities, having been led exclusively by two tribes from independence, we had always found a way to gloss over the issues of negative ethnicity hoping that by ignoring the issue, it would somehow sort itself out. Nothing could have been further from the truth. In fact, in the year 2002, after what many say was Kenya's first truly democratic multi-party elections, a new government was ushered in that raised the expectation of the citizenry. Hopes were high that equitable development, economic uplift, would impact the lives of every Kenyan without discrimination. During this brief honeymoon phase, the country's economy boomed, with Kenya posting a real GDP growth rate of 6.9% at the close of 2007. However, trouble was brewing and the coalition in power started to strain at the seams. The feeling that electoral promises on the distribution of political power among different communities were not being honored all came to the fore. The differences came out in the open when the first attempt was made at, at a constitutional referendum in 2005, the government-sponsored referendum bill was resoundingly rejected by we who were in the opposition, and unfortunately the stage set for a monumental fight in the run-up to the 2007 election. When the election came round, it seemed that the perfect trifecta had formed. The inequalities in development became more and more difficult to ignore. The feelings of some communities that they had been excluded from the national agenda or outrightly subjugated by the government of the day was palpable. All that was needed to ignite the, situ the situation was a closely contested election. And when that came, the tinderbox was lit. The rest, as we say, is history, and unfortunately the start of one of the darkest moments in Kenya's independent era. When the dust had settled, Kenya thereafter was to experience its most profound constitutional moment yet. The fear of a return to violence created the much needed environment for constitutional reforms that would transform the system of governance from that of a powerful central government to that of a devolved system of governance. The premise of the reforms was to find a way to guarantee equitable distribution of development across the entire country as a matter of right and not by dint of any political privilege. <coughs> I am grateful to God for allowing me the opportunity to be the first president to implement Kenya's 2010 new constitution.
However, that said, the years following the passage of this historic new constitution, the underlying issues around ethnic inclusion at the national level did not fade away. And the situation once again came to a head in 2017, almost 10 years to the month after the post-election violence of 2007. I, as head of state and government, was determined not to let history repeat itself. I had spent the last, the, the last two years of my first term trying to make up for the lost time that had been wasted running back and forth from The Hague. My administration was therefore working double time to try and fulfill our election pledges and to allow us the option to seek a fresh mandate in 2017. The 2017 election proved to be yet another milestone moment in my political life. For the first time in Kenya's history, the outcome of a general election had been overturned by the courts. Whether on account of judicial activism or plain ignorance, the decision of the Supreme Court to overturn my August victory and order fresh elections was all that was needed to put the country on an extremely dangerous footing. The constitutional lacuna surrounding the lack of defined and codified rules of engagement for the operations of government in the event of such a repeat election exasperated the situation even further. As the country prepared to go back to the polls for a second time on October 26, 2017, the main opposition parties made the decision to boycott the polls and whereas the victory of my party was all but assured, the victory came at a price. Once again, two communities had gotten their way yet again and the much touted tyranny of numbers had delivered another victory with staggering efficiency. Indeed, the intelligence reports in the days and weeks after the election and my subsequent inauguration pointed towards growing intercommunal and inter-ethnic unrest, more so in some hotspots, particularly in the mass urban settlements of Nairobi and in our lakeside region of our country. Our security services adopted a containment posture and did their best in, prevent, in preventing the situation from escalating. And as I was getting my daily updates, I was reassured that normalcy would be restored. And indeed it was. However, ladies and gentlemen, as it has been said by leaders across the world, peace is not informed purely by the absence of conflict. By the time Christmas of 2017 was approaching, it became clear to me that the calm that had returned to the country had been replaced by an inexplicable sadness and a tangible despondency that had seeped into the hearts and minds of large sections of our population. There were communities that felt defeated, that they had nothing more to lose, and that they no longer wanted to associate with a country known as Kenya because they felt that they had no stake in it. I was not the only one who sensed that there was more that bellied this uneasy calm and that something serious and possibly more sinister was slowly brewing. The economy had not bounced back at the pace we had anticipated. Investors had adopted a wait-and-see attitude. And even though my coalition had an overwhelming majority in both houses of parliament, the politics 
seem to be all wrong. And all this happening at a time when I was reconstituting my cabinet, putting in place the organization needed to deliver on the remainder of our pledges to the people of Kenya. But it was then that I was reminded about the inverse court Instant breaking news from all over the globe. Live streaming of your favorite programs delivered directly to you. Watch anytime from anywhere on your mobile or smart devices. Download the TVC News app today. Available on Google Play and Apple Store. Nigeria's Mohamedou Buhari will step down after elections in February, having served two terms. If my years in public service have taught me anything, it is that we must keep faith with those values that endure. These include, but not limited to, such values as justice, honor, integrity, ceaseless endeavor, and partnership within and between nations. Our strongest moments have always been when we remain true to the basic principle of tolerance, community, and abiding commitment to peace and goodwill towards all. I thank you all. Nigerian global brand is much stronger. And I think a lot of that is due to the persona of the president, President Muhammadu Buhari. Uh, he's widely respected uh, across the globe. And so he has become really the personification in many ways of the country. So the country is able to benefit from his personal brand. And his personal brand is of, of a leader who is an anti-corruption crusader. For this reason, he was made the anti-corruption champion of the African Union and was invited by global heads of states on that basis. And he's also recognized as um, a very strong and effective leader. And we've seen this with the number of Nigerians he has been able to put in the most important organizations in the world, key organizations.